After he came out of hospital, he was very depressed. He didn't really do anything at all for a few weeks, just indoors. And then he got a phone call from Sylvia saying, would he do a Christmas episode of EastEnders? But he said, well, it doesn't mean anything because so many times I've thought something's going to come of it. So he just went and did the episode and he was quite prepared just for the one episode. So he did it and I don't think he really enjoyed no. doing that one. Oh. Oh. Pauline! Pauline! Come quick, it's her to the wagon. I think you might. Oh, Mum. Back again like oh, a bad penny. Darling. Oh, God. Arthur, quick, it's come on. Come in, Hello, son. How are you? Nice to see you. Give him a chance, Pauline. Give him a chance. I want to know. I want to know everything. Oh, I'm living in Gloucester at the moment. Gloucester? Why? I've got a mate, sir. That's all. I'm not stopping. I've got to get my lift back first thing tomorrow. Did you notice any change in him? Yes, I did. I noticed that he communicated a bit less. And if he made a mistake, he couldn't quite handle it. He, you know, if the producer, he became very quiet in his acting. In fact, it was difficult to hear him. His audibility diminished. And he, he couldn't take anyone saying, well, now come along. And, of course, people were impatient with him. They were very impatient. And the more impatient they grew, the more less he was able to cope. Oh, he's had a long journey. Give him a cup of tea and a bit of yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Or some Christmas dinner, eh? There's plenty, yeah. isn't there, Cap? Yeah. Do you want some yeah. turkey? Yeah. Right? A cup of tea would be fine. When I've had that, I'll tell you what I've been up to. Yeah. All right, then. All right. At Christmas, I was away on a scout jamboree. I'm with Dabra on holiday and out of the country as well. We'd arranged for David to stay with some friends of ours. But when we returned, we learned that David had attempted to commit suicide. By the time we came home, he was out of hospital. And it was just a shock. So it took some time for it all to sink in. And then we learnt that whilst we'd been away, David had been constantly pestered by the news of the world. They just wouldn't leave him alone. They were on the phone daily and on the phone to his agent. They wanted a story from David and David didn't want to do it. But they just wouldn't accept that. And in the end they said to Sylvia Young, well if you won't give us an interview we're going to print our story anyway. And they told her what they were going to print. If David would speak um, to, to them they would write a sympathetic article. And we, as his agent, should persuade him to do so, because if we didn't, they would then publish an article about drug taking. They said they had proof. I said that wasn't possible. They couldn't have proof, but they said they would publish that story. I did remind them that David was very sick, and he wasn't in a fit state to do any interview at all, and that should they publish any story, that it would have a very adverse effect on him in his current state of mind. In fact, I do remember saying that I think um, his life could be in their hands. About a week after we'd returned, two men came to the front door. They said they were freelance journalists trying to make a story on David in a pop group. They didn't say that they were reporters from the news of the world. They said they were freelance writers who wanted to do a story for a teenage magazine because they'd heard David was going to form a band. And David said to them, well, that's not true. I don't know where you got that story from. There's nothing in it. And that was the end of the conversation, as far as they were concerned. But then, of course, they started asking questions like, how are you feeling now? And he said, all right. And they kept on saying, how are you feeling? Are you doing anything? How's your career going? And I realised, I mean, this is a matter of a minute or so, I realised who they were. And I said, um, I think you'd better go now. And they still carry on talking as you're shutting the front door. They never give up. The press were parked down the end of the road in their cars. And they'd stop kids down the end of the road, see if they would say anything about David. They were in the local shop, 
as if they could get any form of story out of anybody. The press were coming in in droves, pumping us for information. The constant sort of fear of, you know, God, are we going to say something we shouldn't, or, you know, are we going to be misquoted? Um, but we were surprised at the tactics of the of, of the reporters. He tried to ask various questions. I said, well, I said, I don't really know. I said, he's only a customer in the pub, you know. Comes in, I said, it's, that's it. But then, when they started hanging around for two or three days, I knew that they was after other things because, in the meantime, I'd heard that David had been into hospital. And I realised the devious methods they was trying to get people and me to say things which we didn't know anything about. In the end, I had to say, look, you know, enough is enough. We don't know anything. Please leave the shop. You know, and at the time, there was about nine of them in here at the, uh, when I said that. They were using massive telephoto lenses pointed at every room in the house, especially David's. He didn't come near the window or move around in his own room. That went on for two weeks. They kept knocking on the door for an interview, and uh, David couldn't even answer the door in case it was them that rang. Then they'd phone and say, have we spoken to David? Will he do an interview? I just kept saying no.